All right, well, I'm going to get started. Um, updates this week. We have a new viewer out. That's Mate L. It has a bunch of bug fixes and an even lower than ever crash rate, which should all be good. Um, and it's named after some beverage that I've never personally experienced, but that is apparently sometimes made with scorpions. So that's an added plus, I guess. Um, let's see. Other than that, uh, we are, and but because of that, we are engaged in the usual round of merges now. All of the existing RCs are going to need to get uh, merged with the latest released viewer. So that means you'll be seeing updates soon for the MFA viewer and the performance improvements viewer. And it also means that we'll be having a new one or more new mate viewers coming out pretty soon. We've got a, a few in the works. So that means that QA is very busy and, uh, you know, we'll be getting those out as uh, as and when they get reviewed. Let's see. Other than that, uh, we do not have a ton of new news. There's a couple of pending projects. Uh, I mentioned performance improvements already. That one is in the just one more bug state, uh, unfortunately. It's not too uncommon with uh, graphics viewers especially, where we'll have, uh, you know, kind of bugs trickling in for a while before it looks like it's really stable. Um, so, but the list is not super long, so our, uh, we're hopeful that we can get that out before too much longer. The other project that we've been talking about a bit at the content creators group is uh, material, new material support. Um, a couple of different things there. One is making it easier to apply uh, kind of a common set of material properties to different objects and faces. Uh, and and uh, the one that people are probably more excited about is trying to work our way toward support for uh, PBR, which is uh, uh, kind of more modern style rendering with fancy reflections and shiny metal objects and various goodies. Um, so we will be to update you on that. Don't have a definite roadmap on it yet, but we're in the process of trying to get that sorted out. Uh, yeah, performance improvements is viewer 546 branch. And uh, too early for teaser pictures, sorry. It would just be a bunch of uh, boring documents at this point. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So I think that's it for updates. Uh, I know we had at least one agenda item that uh, I think Bonnie put in. Bonnie, you want to uh, you want to take it away for a while? Yeah, I haven't been to one of these in quite a while. Um, this was just to give a heads up. Uh, something is heading to QA, and it's going to be relevant to all developers. I'm. Uh, fix the offline offers handling for friendship and group invitations. Uh, this has required a kind of radically new implementations for a series of capabilities. Uh, read offline meetings, messages, accept friendship, decline friendship, accept group invite, decline group invite. So warning you that these are worth testing and looking at specifically. Um, this round of work is just to get the features working again. Uh, some future time, I'd like to revisit this and do something more interesting and bolder with it. Um, in addition to that, I kind of reanimated a little bit the old current sim capabilities wiki page. Uh, let's see, where is that? Let's put that in here. There we go. Um, this used to be where we cap a public record of kind of all the caps we supported and what was expected to work and try to document them a little bit. That's gotten very old and very stale. Um, the list is now complete, I believe, but the documentation is still a little short. But I'm trying to start updating that and uh, correcting the old stale update bits as time permits. So some of the new uh, work is showing up there as well. This is all happening under the D third sim five three seven label. Uh, I hope it spends very little time on a DD, but while it's there, uh, point your stuff at it, make certain it works as expected, and scream if something breaks. And that's it. Yep. Oh, thanks, Monty. 
So if people want to experience this for themselves, they just need to do things that generate notices on Aditi, or do they need to go to particular regions? They can generate them anywhere, which is invite your test account to, uh, to friendship, or uh, invite them into a group. The test is to have the viewer log into a DirtSim 537 region specifically. Uh, and only if you log into a DirtSim 537 region will you get the new and updated behavior. That's the uh, extent of the testing. Okay, sounds good. And so they should see uh, in those regions, they should get uh, notices, you know, more timely, reliable fashion, all, all that good stuff. And they will function. You can accept them. That's the, okay. that's the critical part. Good. All right. I think that's all we have for the agenda today. Uh, Alexa, anything uh, you want to say on the kind of product side of the house? Uh, let's see, a couple things. Uh, we're still working on the performance uh, viewer. Uh, thanks to uh, Beck and Polly sale, they found a, an issue with the uh, onion skins, which I was able to reproduce. So grab some more information for that. So we're going to keep working on that. Um, the profiles viewer, um, we are continuing to work on that. I uh, got some great feedback from uh, a few people on, let's see, uh, functionality, the need for um, scripts to be able to pull the user UUID so that, you know, when you're in a club, et cetera, it says, can I post your picture, um, you know all that kind of information that we've seen, uh, making sure all of that still works as expected, and uh, talking about changing our aspect ratio um, from the square to the four-thirds like uh, most of the other uh, profile have for other viewers. So. Uh, uh are there any viewers that just, or any development branches where you guys are just focusing on refactoring and modernizing? Like, I, I hear, like, features, improvements, bug fixes, but, like, do you guys have anybody dedicated there to just modernizing the code? Like, there's there's C-style casts all over the place. You've got bulls declared as signed integers. Like, the amount of archaic stuff. I, I had to literally go and find an ATI paper from 2004 because you guys are using the shader object uh, ARB extension, which which was made for like OpenGL 1.1 or to 1.4 to get it in line to OpenGL 2.0 to even support shaders, and then you're kind of Frankensteining that all the way up to something in the threes somewhere. Now, like I, I, I'm just wondering, are there any efforts internally to just modernize that? Um, I can try and take that. Um... Um, th there's a lot of discussions internally. There's no viewer on the side where we've kind of gone through the code and attempted to do that. I, I think, you know, some of the things that you're discussing have been, you know, uh, if, if Dave P were here, I, I'd have a, uh, have, have a much more direct conversation with you about, you know, the graphics pipe in particular. Um, I, I, I'm just saying in general, like, the, is, is there anybody, you know, whether it be an intern or some, you know, one or two employees just dedicated to just modernizing the code base. The amount of old gray beard sea stink that's in the code base, for lack of a better word, there's a lot of it. <laughs> like, I, I, I decided to go into, the, like, and, and like convert all the bulls using, what is it, sea line here to proper mm -hmm. booleans. And in doing that, I found that there was some genius who decided to cast a a pointer and store the pointer address in a boolean. I don't know how that got through QA. <laughs> it's very interesting. That's a that's an interesting take on a boolean. But uh, like I, having modern readable code that anybody who's finished university or school in the last five to ten years can read is is a pretty big deal, especially when you guys are banking on open you know source development from the community because nobody's going to want to touch that if they have to go and you know dig out some 20 year old textbook or some ancient ATI paper or you know whatever else to, to actually figure out how to 
to do modern development on this thing. I think the other thing I can add is if you check out our latest performance hero branch, um, I mean, uh, Dave did remove a tremendous amount of code. And so, you know, as we move forward with uh, optimizing features, as we move forward with adding new features, we are going back in there, making changes, making things better. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, um, like, I, I, I had somebody here. Long... Like Go tell ahead. me that there's there's core open GL support. So I went and looked into that and, and whatever that <laughs> the interpretation of core open GL that is being stretched to its extent. Like sure you guys bind a VAO, but you guys do nothing with it. You you do that simply to get core support status. I still see active client or client state arrays being used. I, I can't even find documentation online on how to modernize that no modern OpenGL or any hell OpenGL in the last fifteen years. Like I, I I had to go in and literally, you know, the, the GL handle arb or whatever the hell I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. Like that 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 should not be a thing. There there are literally off the shelf replacements for some of the stuff you guys have in the code base, like uh, like GLU, like the original glue, like what is it, the Alchemy Viewer he uses glue, which is GLEW, for doing the, the function loading for the OpenGL functions. That's literally a drop-in, single-header add-in that you guys can add to your make system. Like, I, I, I don't understand how that hasn't happened yet. And, and even having glue in the code base, they ended development for that in 1998. So let, let that sink in. You guys have code dependencies, which basically haven't been supported for almost a quarter of a century festering around in the code base and there are modern off the shelf endorsed by Kronos solutions like GLM that could be implemented in that. I, I, I don't know how that is still sitting there. I'm not saying it's pretty. I hope you glad you got it off your chest. It's well understood and I heard your message. I, I don't want to sound negative, but when I hear, you know, uh, whoever was here the week before going on about adding mirrors to the code base and talking about a communal experience, you want to know what a communal experience is, being able to render more than a couple dozen avatars in a sim, you know, them animating and moving while pushing double-digit frame rates. There should be a feature we, we, freeze. We share that, my friend. We share that, my friend. Check out the latest performance here. Yeah. Uh, I'll look at it. And the, the build system, please have somebody look at the build system. I have removed like 12 make files by simply cleaning up the main make file. <laughs> is, is there any plans to like, um, I guess, push for for retiring some of the stuff like the old boost libraries that have now become like common and part of STL. You can with the view. Yeah, well generally the way we handle this sort of thing is, you know, we kind of modernize, you know, as we go, as it's required by a particular project. Um, you know, I know that, uh, uh, I know it would make people happy to see, you know, all it's roughly a million lines of code, you know, to see all of that in kind of current best practices, C++ and, and current best practices, OpenGL. Um, you know, but realistically, we could have the entire team work on that for, you know, literally years and, and produce absolutely nothing except things that people would enjoy looking at better. So, you know, from a, from a resource allocation perspective, uh, it's it's very hard to justify that. We don't tend to have an effort which is, you know, don't tend to have a viewer which is purely focused on uh, improving the, improving or modernizing the code. The closest thing we have to that is, you know, times when we went to 64-bit or times when we are updating to a, a, you know, newer version of the compiler chain where, um, you know, there's there's sort of a some sort of bulk change to the code base to address you know all of the issues that uh, we run into when when migrating compilers. Um, 
but uh, you know most of these things are going to be more focused efforts where we're trying to fix you know exactly what we need to 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 get a particular uh, uh, new feature out or whatever. Vir, could you talk a little bit? Like we've had discussions about moving to Vulkan or moving to other alternative APIs off of OpenGL and how that might clean up a bunch of things. Uh, I mean, I think we've had those discussions, and I think we've even mentioned that in this in this uh, group. Do you want to remind me and, and the rest of the team kind of what was on the table there? Uh, yeah. Well, so Vulkan is a you know more modern API than than OpenGL. Um, has the potential to give us better performance um, and potentially uh, 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 you know just be uh, be an improvement in in various other respects. The um, uh, biggest obstacle to Vulcan for us right now is, you know, A, it's just a big project, uh, and B, it is, which, you know, kind of has to justify itself in the context of all the other possible projects, and B, not everybody has support for it. So there would be a significant chunk of our current U Windows users who wouldn't be able to run a viewer that was uh, purely migrated to Vulcan. Um, trying to support multiple APIs is, uh, you know, one option. There are some libraries that attempt to sort of straddle between multiple graphics APIs, um, but, uh, you know, you're usually going to run into sort of leaky abstraction problems with those where, you know, something doesn't quite uh, fit equally well in all those uh, possible branches. Um, you know, we've done a fair amount of digging into it. At this point, we don't really have anything to announce about time frame. Um, you know, are we someday going to change to a more recent graphics API than OpenGL? You know, almost certainly, but uh, I can't tell you, uh, uh, you know, a day or a date on that. Um, you could have told me, do you want to talk uh, uh, any more about the kind of issues around, around Vulkan and uh, graphics APIs in general? Well, I mean, it, so I think we've observed a lot of the frustration that was just being voiced, and and uh, and and also we we do when there's an opportunity to strip out crufty old stuff, we have taken that in the past. Um, you know, if you looked at the the code a year ago, there was a lot of truly ancient fixed function code that's it's gone now, and. Um, and and so and so going forward, I think we'd all appreciate uh, you know a new API, probably Vulkan, um, for not just for the performance of the API, but because uh, it would it would sort of force a uh, a whole cloth you know rewrite of the rendering system and uh, you know get rid of all the legacy chunks that are still floating around in there. Um, uh, certainly we could expect better performance out of Vulkan, um, but it's, you know, it's a big job. Uh, you know, the Vulkan is famous for the uh, hello triangle example being a thousand lines of code. And uh, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not, not really much. You know, there's just a lot of what OpenGL drivers do for you we have to do for ourselves in Vulcan, and that's just a really big job. So we're, I think, considering it very carefully before we dive in there. Would there be a world where you modernize what OpenGL you have, move to things like direct state access, clean up a lot of you know the unnecessary gunk like the the binding and gen nonsense and the six million overloaded functions for for whatever? Like just first modernize the OpenGL, like. You're going to up your min system rec that people have to have Vulkan. First, up the OpenGL, modernize it. I mean, there is still some interoperability. That a lot of people say when you know porting a pipeline between OpenGL to Vulkan, it's like you want to make your your OpenGL pipeline as multi-threaded, as a, you know asynchronous, you know support all over the place as possible, and then you do the port to Vulkan. Because like doing a full system rewrite. Of an entirely separate renderer in Vulkan, as you said, it's a tremendous effort. Like I, I, I don't envy that, but I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to understand the the approach here of like why, if if you are going that route, why not modernize what is there? So, and I think we do that, but it's you know it's maybe not evident. 
uh, it certainly isn't just a global scrub the code base effort, right? It, there's always some, you know, underlying goal, be it performance or, you know, a, a, a change in a, uh, in a quality or removing an artifact. For whatever reason, uh, we don't just do it in for code, we don't just do it for code hygiene. Um, and which is what I, I think you'd like. I think I think we'd all like that, yeah, honestly. It, it, do you guys have any CI CD systems there? Or like even an automated like a linting system before something like what, what is your PR process? Like if somebody actually attempts to merge something to one of the branches there or opens up a PR, like our, how much automated infrastructure do you guys have before something goes in? Uh, well, we have a, an automated build system. I don't know that I'm the right person to speak about all the different tools. It's definitely not my particular forte. Like um, a lot, a lot of the code hygiene, just just even in terms of formatting. Like one of the things I did when I first cloned the repo was I just hit it with a just just a format pass, just so I could make everything readable. Because everybody's the you know brackets all over the place. There, and then I hit it with a CPP check to see you know how can I clean up the constructors. Like this, this is a basic like low hanging like fruit you know kind of yeah. solution. Yeah, understand tabs versus spaces maybe um, would be awesome, but. Uh, we have a, uh, we're sort of restricted in not wanting to upset the apple cart for merges, especially as you know external uh, viewers pull our code. Um, if they see, uh, if they get a huge merge issue based on a bunch of white space that we've moved around, um, you can hide white space changes on on Git. Like that, that I, I do it all the time at work. We we had to do the pep eight conversion for probably around eighty thousand lines of code. Now you guys have a much larger code base, but you don't have like you know C plus plus is white space independent. You can do that per module at a time, or you know a couple batches. Nobody's saying that you have to do the entire thing. You you can well, break up that 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 work so that people have time to adapt to it. You, you, it might surprise you that that you and I are arguing on the same side of that particular uh, point. But to date, it hasn't uh, risen to the to the point where we've decided to go ahead well, and do it. This is the group that would, you know, the white space changes is going to impact this group of people. So if this group of people said, yeah, clean it all up. I mean, that's something that is easy to, like you said, put through an automated tool. But there's a reason we haven't done it mainly because I don't think this group of people want it. Yeah, I think if we can establish, a, you know, a, a well-supported tool chain, you know, use the appropriate Git options or whatever that allows us to, you know, merge multiple lines of, of independent development, um, you know, without white space triggering massive conflicts, um, then it's it becomes a much more thinkable thing. And uh, it's, you know, it's, as I say, if, if we get to the point where we have a, a path forward, then, you know, we're, we're, we'd be prepared to have that discussion. Um, but uh, you know, white space fixes obviously are a, are a fairly minor fix up. It's it's not nearly as uh, it's not nearly as deep a dive as uh, a lot of the other things you've been asking about. I mean, we we do have a coding standard. Um, it, it's it has changed over the years, while the actual code itself has not changed as quickly. Um, but then that's you know publicly visible, I believe, on our on our wiki. Sure how how does like the like the QA process for like a code submit work? Like how many like reviews does something take, or like how how does it get shipped around essentially internally if somebody from the community wants to, to merge something? Well, we do pull requests and the other you mean among the development team. Um, okay. Okay. QA doesn't uh, typically weigh in on a pull request, right? They'll they test functionality, but they aren't. Uh, so there's nobody dedicated to just like code quality then. Well, uh, you you might say that, or you might say we all do uh, what we can, right? But we're, we we are constrained enough. by the um, by the fact that we're we are not just pretty pretty up to code. We're we're never just going through and well, we're almost never just going through and, and making it prettier. Uh, although the, the you know, I think if you ask any one of us, the desire is there to do it. Um, 
is it a problem from like upper management that they're just not giving you guys like more to resort? Like I, I see these Linden Lab like ads on like Twitter and LinkedIn. They got people riding around bicycles and yoga balls and mocap like systems. Like where's all the money going for for more developers? Need to come hire you, and you you can do it all yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, you you might notice that uh, at the top level the repo is a a, a Clang format file, and you know we do that is maintained that that. Um, and I personally use it, but only uh, apply it to the whole code base. So if uh, if we're working on a, a, a chunk of code, I'll frequently apply it to the code under review, or I mean under modification. Um, but to date, we haven't agreed to, to just apply it across the board. So uh, I guess as everybody can see, we're past the preset announcements phase of the meeting and into the open questions. Any other uh, topics people want to bring up this week? Accessibility features. Um, I mean, that's a great question. We we do look at those issues to some extent as we are working on kind of individual UX designs. Um, but uh, at some point, it, it would probably be a, a good idea to do a more kind of deep dive on that to, to see how, you know, consistently and, and correctly we're addressing those kinds of things. Um, are there particular kinds of uh, Accessibility features you're thinking of there, um, uh, you know, other than the, the closed captions. Yeah, coffee. I think that's that's a really good point, and uh, uh, it's 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 probably uh, something that we should uh, should be giving some more some more thought to in the future. Um, let's see another. Yeah, hearing impairments. What? Well, yeah, there's the. Yeah, that one we have spent some time investigating back. Um, it's. Uh, it's not entirely clear whether that is really compatible with our current uh, kind of Vivox usage and and Vivox's capabilities, but we are we are discussing it with them. The uh, yeah the, the 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 thing Beck is asking about is a, a feature to uh, kind of basically allow you to suppress the the uh, kind of spatially based volume adjustment um, you know normally you you hear people you know louder or softer based on how close they are to you in world and this would be an attempt to make that uh, you know more uniform for some for at least for some area within which everybody could be heard I had a question for this group actually kind of that's somewhat related I mean what, what's come up in internal conversations has been a bidding box. Uh, obviously, the, a lot of the reasons why we kind of like we talk about it and then we, we set it aside is just because of the coordination between all of us to do it and flip the switch at the same time is like, ah, yeah, let's not bother. Is there an interest in getting, you know, upgraded voice APIs from, from this group? Uh, because if there is, then, you know, it's something I can start discussing internally again. But, you know, uh, I just want awareness that. Uh, upgrading voice was seen as a big pain because of the, all the coordination done with uh, with third parties. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's that's definitely something where a change would uh, uh, be, you know, fairly traumatic across everybody, right? All the basically all the viewers that want to support voice would have to would have to switch at the same time. Uh, let's see, we have a question about, uh, is there a problem releasing an MFA catsnip viewer? Um, that's, I don't think so. I think our general policy is to say that uh, once something is out in RFC, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's fair game. In the case of MFA, that will be, you know, it's, it's in a pretty stable state. I think we had one small bug fix in the last release so you know i i do think that at some point it's you know in the not too distant future it's going to go out as an updated uh you know as, as an updated default viewer in in more or less its current form so um but i wouldn't i wouldn't foresee any uh issues with with moving forward with that if you uh if you wanted to Uh, Beck, you mentioned concerns about Vivox. Are there other things you would, uh, you know, other particular services that you're interested in or other ways you'd like to see voice being approached? So you're saying I should ask High Fidelity to uh, open source their code and just give it out? <laughs> so. I mean, uh, no, I, I want to be clear. High Fidelity is a separate company. Um, Philip, Philip basically is with us and with them. But obviously, you know, we have a good relationship with them. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't want you to assume that we have acquired uh, High Fidelity of waste technology. Yeah, uh, Beck, I'm not sure about all the issues around Vivox 5. I'm pretty sure we're still on 4, partly because, uh, you know, just switching would be another one of those everything breaks all at once kinds of uh, changes. We haven't had a, you know, sufficiently strong reason to be willing to 
undertake that particular uh, uh, type of pain. I'm not seeing a swell of people asking us to take on that pain either. So um, looks like we've got problems and bigger problems to, to sort out. All right, any other topics for this week? Would it be possible to get the pathfinding options moved to the build menu? Just uh, taking the existing the options, building a new tab in the build menu, putting all of the pathfinding options that are scattered across the client into one menu. Uh, potentially. I think you posted a, a link to uh, what your... Yeah, I wrote a custom, I, I wrote an XML one. from scratch last night referencing all of the different pathfinding options that exist in the client that are scattered everywhere. Uh -huh. Put them in there. But if yeah. this could be put into the official client... That'd be great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, if we have a pull request, we'll look at it. If we have a, a you know, a JIRA for a feature request, uh, we'll look at it. I, I think you, you've probably got a point that that would be, uh, that would be an improvement, um, but we don't have it uh, immediately in our queue right now. Okay, I'll get to my list. Okay, thanks. Yeah, pathfinding is one of those areas that we we know definitely needs some some love and attention when we can uh, when we can manage it. Uh, uh, Joe, I know you had uh, uh, you had to go through a fair amount of pain and suffering to get uh, Animesh NPCs working, you know, largely because of pathfinding issues. 
the pathfinding uh, rebake region option needs to be a queue that's automatic rather than manually set as well, which is also going to it's also in my notes. Okay, thanks for the link. Uh, on the uh, on the buildings with linked doors. Uh, so, Joe, for your purposes, trying to, uh, you know, make NPCs more commercially viable, um, is, is this one issue kind of your biggest showstopper, or is it more of a, uh, is it more of a kind of a set of different things that would have to be addressed? It's primarily that setting up a parcel is a very time-consuming activity and nobody knows how because pathfinding is used so little i believe that's partly because all the pathfinding options are scattered across the client and uh there's nothing to really guide you in that effort and also you have to rebake the region anytime pathfinding is changed on any object it's not an automatic process to rebake the region like there's no there's like no one knows to go into link sets. Why would you ever go into link sets when you're editing a cube or a floor? The problem is not so much the options as that it's hard. There's a, there are a lot of implicit rules that are barely documented, such as a link set has to be slightly greater than 10 meters in each dimension before pathfinding will pick it up. But the tools don't tell you this. This is also true. The documentation is poor. Also, links, uh, or sorry, not links, but uh, individual prims that are next to each other but not uh, lined up correctly. Well, the nav mesh will generate a, a surface across them. Even though those prims are touching, sometimes it won't actually join that nav mesh. It'll just put a nav mesh on both those surfaces, but they, 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 they're not connected, even though the prims are touching. Things like that. You're saying it kind of understands topological adjacency but not just kind of geometric adjacency yes yeah I was if that's a systemic issue in general to the viewer like uh, apparently I was reading like way back when with mesh uploads you guys had like support for custom pivot points if you want people to use like you know good content creation practices like modular workflow especially for like large scale things like buildings or anything like that having settable custom pivot points instead of just Get it going to the object origin and the medium, and expecting to people to use offset geometry so that that things line up correctly is uh, should probably be on the menu one of these days. <laughs> oh yes, custom pivot points are definitely on the menu. Uh, and snap to functions like snap to surface. Uh, Ryder, do you happen to remember where we are with custom pivot points? I, I know at one point we had viewer support in a branch and we we're waiting on some server side changes. I'm not sure if the server changes are done now and it's back to the viewer or if that's still yeah. in the queue somewhere. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, the server changes have not been done yet. That is actually on my, on my short queue of, of, of upcoming, uh, upcoming simulators. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I'm keeping with the I am I am keeping with the Linden tr tradition of I I am not going to give a date other than uh, soon, but it is it is uh, on the queue. I will need at some I believe I'll need to coordinate with uh, with the viewer team on that since I am sure the viewer in places assumes that. Uh, 
the pivot on on any object is at its center. Yeah. Which would no longer that would that would no longer be true. And uh, once this is in, um, so you probably get some very confusing look, uh, some very confusing edit tools. Wouldn't those snap too? Would the solution to that be like to port the existing code base over like the asset? Uh, on the server side over, so you, you generate whatever database that stores all this stuff, a new entry for the content that you currently have that sets the, you know, pivot point at the center. And when you, you guys add support for new pivot points, any new content coming in, you then override that entry with the, the custom pivot point, essentially, and then that gets streamed to the viewer and gets used. Well, sort of. Um... The the plan that I have the the plan that I have laid out actually is to allow uh, both at upload and through LSL the ability to set the pivot on any on any given prim. On any given All item. right. Um, if there is a viewer that will do so up at upload. Um, I'm not sure what state that the viewer is in. Um, and it had, it had a number of problems. Um, I've been a little reticent uh, to, to hurry this up since it will, uh, as I said, it would also force uh, some viewer changes to uh, uh, the, so, you know, the, the viewer side would have to scramble to keep up. It's kind of semi-related to, to like snapping. Have you guys ever considered like adding support in the render for like a second UV layer to apply light maps to? Like a lot of the content, guys basically burn through bandwidth where people are doing essentially different skews where they bake out the lighting for textures of like this is the red one with baked lighting this is the green one with baked lighting this is the black one with baked lighting if you could just have a diffuse or, or you know base color layer and then support for a low resolution either whether it be colored shadow map or just you know grayscale shadow map you'd be able to have baked in AO support people would be able to reduce the texture budgets on a lot of items that way how they even be able to use you know things like tiling textures for, for one layer and then apply like a, a, a light map that gets blended on the final shading pass like uh, has there ever been any exploration into that actually that I I'm I'm this is a little out of my this is a little out of my uh, my wheelhouse but that sounds a good deal like some of the conversations is going on in in uh, the creators meeting. Correct me if I'm Yeah, we were discussing all of that uh, for a good amount of time yesterday. Uh, okay, yeah, because like the, uh, the, the uh, one one more thing I gotta show you guys is like the 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 object I guess complexity costs and like land impact costs or things like I I I don't understand the sense of it like. From a from a server streaming side, it takes a lot like much more bandwidth, even with JPEG two thousand compression, to send a load of textures than it sends, you know, than it costs to send, you know, you know, a, a pretty complicated mesh. Like I, I the, have you guys thought about implementing the, like LI costs that increase due to how much texture usage I, I, they have? Actually you you are not the 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 simulators and, and the actual servers do not send mesh or texture. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, mesh texture. Most uh, animations those don't actually pass through the servers. Um, those are retrieved directly from the CDN by the viewer. Uh, the viewer, the simulators actually just tell you which one to get. Okay. So you're looking at a UUID, uh, and then. Uh, the, the viewer takes that UUID and then goes goes and asks the uh, 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 goes and asks the uh, the C, the CDN for that. So that that's not plugging the pipeline between. Uh, I was going to but throughput wise, I, I guess I'm wondering like in terms of LI costs for things like it, 
is there any kind of internal effort to encourage, I suppose, content creators to have better practices where they use less textures, where they, you know, we, we penalize less for geometry content since it's relatively cheap for any sort of modern card. You're, you're preaching. You're preaching to the choir with regards to uh, land impact. Um, um, there is a project, I do not know its state or where it is, called Arctan. Yeah, Arctan is a is currently on hold, but it's a project to update uh, avatar rendering cost, which is slightly different than updating land impact because avatar rendering cost is purely a viewer side entity and land impact is actually calculated and, and enforced by the server um, but yeah any any criticisms you have of the land impact formula are probably correct um, we we definitely know that it needs to be improved um, yeah this is one of these things that's complicated by um, you know a just trying to come up with, with the better formula and b how do you then actually start implementing and enforcing a better formula without uh, you know breaking vast swaths of the world and and uh, making a lot of people very upset um, you know obviously if, if a bunch of stuff that's actually expensive to draw but that we've been pretending is not expensive to draw suddenly gets bumped up to 10 times the land impact and then regions are overflowing and things are getting returning um, getting returned that's going to be uh, highly unpopular so uh, it's uh, it is, there's a kind of an interesting uh, uh, issue there as well as just the purely technical question of what should the formula be. I, I would um, end up waking up with villagers with torches and pitchforks in, in, my, in my front yard. On the note of land impact though, one of the discussions we had yesterday on that topic was uh, using the actual geometry instead of like in you know, like if I take a, a simple cube from Blender with that, you know, just two triangles per face, and I scale it up versus a, a prim in Second Life and scale it up to say 10 meters, the, the simple mesh cube would have larger land impact than the prim, which has more geometry. Well, that, that's what I'm saying, like that the cost it to both like stream that and render that. Like right, it's, so it's pitiful. You're, you're, if, if it was you're based usually... more on the, the 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 geometry, it would make more sense, and it would also cut down on the the, the crazy high poly objects because they they would be forced to, to limit the amount of polys on their on their models in the upload, and also a best practices in the uploaders would be great because then they would have some 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 sort of semblance of how how they should go about. Like if you have a necklace that's really small. You're not going to see all that crazy detail, but it'll have like a, a million polys for no reason that you're never going to see. And when you can see the texture in wireframe, there's there's a problem here. And maybe they well, don't understand. Maybe they well, just don't know. Uh, but uh, like some community outreach that teaches you know people or at least has some guides or, or links to like the basics of like here's how you retopologize something. Here's the the basic workflow for a lot of common DCC applications like that. That kind there's, of thing would go a long way. <laughs> there's a lot of industry standards in in that in regards to that 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 work across platforms for like yeah like you said high to low poly modeling, texture workflows. You know you're only gonna see any of the detail in that in that necklace when you when you get really up close in the, with the with their camera. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. I, I think this is this is our lot right with user generated content is. Uh, people make bad content and we may give them incentives and guidelines to try and incentivize better content uh, with all the consequences that and pitchforks that come with that. Um, you know, ultimately, we, you know, uh, some things we've thought of, actually, we, I think we have a, a viewer we've been playing with is just taking, um, taking things out of, uh, of people's hands, like, you know, Designing LEDs or performance fallbacks or, or ways of dealing with that content, and, and then basically saying, "Yeah, I know you want to present this and render this, but uh, we're not going to do it. We're going to do something that's simplified, or we're going to transform this geometry into something else." So I don't know um, how you, you know you all feel about that. Is is should we be making a bigger effort to um, 
take UGC content and optimizing it for these these uh, um, for people who are making it, right? You know, so we're saying no. <laughs> this well, I don't think you should way. take away. I don't think you should take away like the ability to, to modify or, or change your uh, LED, for instance. I'm just saying like the uploader needs a lot of love or just needs to be rebuilt entirely. And just some general guidelines on best practices would go a long way for a lot of people who just don't know. They don't know, so they, they just don't know the questions to ask. I, I mean, there's I, a lot of new creators. Like I was. Do they know? I mean, I, I think they, they don't care. Well, there's that too. There's the people that don't know, and then there's the people that don't care. But the people that don't know, if they have, if they don't know to ask the questions that they don't know, they don't know where to look. They don't know anything about high poly modeling. They don't know anything about scripting but there's nothing in, there's no incentive anywhere to to push them in the direction of this is how you do high to low poly modeling this would be better if you did it this way you know this is this would be the proper uses of textures for for different objects at different scaling simple things like I I, I I i i i've made content on here where i had no idea what i was doing horribly optimized but that's part of the, the beauty of sl like i i I have a lot to thank with SL and Gary's mod, where you, you pick stuff up, you, you learn 3D modeling, you learn a little bit of coding, and at the beginning, your stuff's, from lack of a better word, shit. It, 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 you're, you're learning, you're, you're tripping over yourself, but like, I, I think the fear of the situation is that if you do clamp down really hard on people, you're going to dissuade those kind of early people that from experimenting and possibly investing more time in this ecosystem, if you want to call it that. But like, yeah. it also might help people as well if they if they don't know where to go, or they might not know what direction to turn. But why isn't this working? Maybe they can yeah. click on this link, and it'll give them some more information about. Oh, I should make textures a little bit smaller because this object is smaller, and you're not going to see that detail, or you know, just a general best practices kind of thing. Because I learned to script, you know, I went from LSL to C sharp to C plus plus from Second Life, learning how to learn LSL. And I also learned modeling and most of that stuff through people in here, from these groups. So like, I don't feel like it would be a disservice to the community if those things were included somewhere. I think it would. I think it would actually help content generation and better Cultivate content generation. A culture of doing it right. <laughs> That's the other thing. LODs should be automatically ge uh, generated. Like any, any like. I think of, I don't think it should be taken modern. away. I think it should be an option if you wanted to have automatic LODs, but don't take away the option to have custom LODs. Because what if I want to make uh, custom LODs where the object is changing shape? So we, don't we have a, a viewer that is uh, in process of doing some of this stuff? Uh, we've done some some experimentation with automatic LODs. Um, you know, we've 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 recently added uh, new a new LOD generation library. Mesh optimizer is what the mesh upload uses now. Um, so yeah, we did some internal tests with just well, what if we just generate all the LODs using mesh optimizer? And you know, overall, it it helps on appearance. It it you know, if if you got stuff where you know regions where if you zoom out, everything looks like crud because there's no LODs. Um, it does a good job of fixing that. Stuff looks a lot better when you when you zoom in or out. Um, it doesn't help with performance as much as we'd like. Um, as as Beck has noted uh, from some extensive experimentation, um, uh, a lot of the cost of rendering really turns out to be more about the number of draw calls rather than the just the sheer number of triangles. And so, or the way we make LODs now, where uh, you're kind of you're still you're still drawing just as many different things. It's just they're smaller. Um, doesn't tend to be a, a huge win on uh, on performance. So I think to come up with LODs that really make things faster and nicer looking, uh, you know, whether automatically generated or whatever, is a uh, is a harder problem that we uh, really need to do more digging into. Yeah, we're uh, we're at time, so uh, understand if everybody has to run, I kind of need to take off too. Oh, well, thanks for coming, everybody. I think we had some uh, good discussions this week, and uh, we'll uh, we'll keep you posted. Thank you for everyone.
Stay safe. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Thank you. Take care. Uh, Grand Pickle, you may want to come to the content creators meeting on every other Thursday where we, we've been discussing uh, some of these issues. Yeah, Dante has been harassing me. I've, I've been just getting so irritated looking at the list. <laughs> a Firestorm and Linux code. But there's a lot take of old a, T stuff. Take a break from looking at code and uh, <laughs> come, uh, listen to the <laughs> different issues. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, we've discussed some of these quite uh, extensively in the last month ish, I guess, or maybe more for oh, well some of the issues definitely go back for, for years, but uh but yeah, definitely come to the every other Thursday meeting and uh discuss some of this stuff and what's uh can be done better. Why fix the compiler wars? We could just disable them with the LL pre process, maybe hell yeah <laughs> Well believe it or not we actually compile with the warnings or errors, so we do actually uh, pay attention to some of that stuff. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, part of the problem too is we're also compiling um, Macs as well, and the Mac that doesn't always have up to date because uh, it's using Clang doesn't always have update uh, C plus plus support. So I'm actually in the process of updating one of my Macs right now, actually. So get a little more modern Xcode and Clang uh, compiler. But, but uh, yeah, and then figuring out what part of the C plus plus <laughs> moving center to it's actually center is on is another issue too. So. At least eleven, please God. <laughs> uh, I th well, I think we I think we have because we're all for, for the most part I think using C plus um, or Microsoft Visual C uh, seventeen. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. V that, that's so, so, so that should take should support that. And I, there's no there's been talk about uh, Visual Studio twenty nineteen. Uh, I know twenty twenty two is is out. Uh, I would hope we'd actually migrate to that sooner, but that's still a little ways off. So yeah, getting the see the thing is all the libraries that we depend upon there's like I don't know like 20 or 30 different libraries and so all they have to be compiled as well so yeah sure I was it doesn't, doesn't break so I was gonna bring that up it'd be nice to have uh, some of the settings that you compile those libraries for I wanted to uh, so I wanted to statically link APR lib and hmm. but it has a bunch of like uh, you know compiler flags of like what what settings or how do you want to compile and I, I have no idea what you guys <laughs> used basically um, so oh. yeah well, part of the problem is some of the libraries we can't d distribute, so like stuff like Havoc, right? So yeah, uh, but but there, yeah, probably should file a JIRA for that. If there's actually libraries that we do actually have source for that say, hey, maybe can we actually get? Uh, you may want to check build variables as well. There's yeah, uh, yeah, to see where that stuff is. So I don't know where all those flags are, but I would start there. And if you can't find it, then file a JIRA. So hey, can you maybe please get some of this stuff documented at least? So at least it's someplace so people can actually find that stuff. <laughs> I, I've been gutting the, the CMake files, and I basically tried to port off as much as I can off of auto build, and then like any of the things yeah. that I could have like statically linked, I, I just used the static linked libraries instead of dynamic linked ones. So I, I I've been trying to clean that up <laughs> my own branch here. Mm. Interesting adventure. Yeah, actually, that's a good point, Kitty. Yes, yeah, Microsoft's actually done a pretty good job of having some of these libraries be backwards compatible so you don't actually have to recompile everything because that was definitely a big problem with some of the earlier Microsoft Visual C stuff is like you change your tool chain and you have to rebuild everything and it's like why you guys make the same compiler it's like you guys know the format for your for your object files and your lib files so why are you breaking this so I mean obviously C++ name mangling kind of was a bit of a monkey wrench for a while there but that should have been long long standardized at least uh, on the Microsoft side of things Yeah. Yeah, a lot of technical debt. It's uh, we run into it all the time. It's, it's definitely a, it's a problem. <laughs> I mean, I think any code base has been around for <laughs> run almost twenty years now. <laughs> twenty years, <laughs> it's, yeah. It looks. It's, it's. I mean, I work on an open source project that's been around for uh since ninety five, and <laughs> we got the same sort of stuff. It's like every every few years we go, okay, hey, what's compilers are we going to still support? And I think having a a plan of supporting a compiler for an, or a IDE for five years seems you seems to be relatively uh kind of rational instead of because no one wants to upgrade tools. I, I personally hate upgrading my compiler. I just want stuff. I already got stuff installed. I just want it to work. So, uh, but. Getting the more modern C++ standards definitely is is kind of nicer for sure. So C++ 11 should should be in there since that's been in since thir C++ what Microsoft Visual C 2013 and I don't know it I guess 2015 I think so yeah, I don't remember offhand. 
Have you guys looked into, uh, like, just a low-level, like, optimization pass of, like, I know there's a lot of, like, the Linden... Like, uh, bugs, well, the like performance gear was some of that, so, uh, yeah, big shout-out to Beck for, uh, getting us on Tracy. So we were using, uh, Red Game Tools, uh, I forget what the, the prof uh, profiler was called, Telemetry, which is kind of an unfortunate, uh, meaning. Uh, so we were using that for a little while, and then we switched over to, uh... Tracy, which was a re really nice profiler, so we've been instrumenting our code with that and uh, looking at that. So the performance viewer in 5.46 is, is kind of, the, the, I guess you'd say, a first pass of the last few months of work on, on that. So just kind of say, hey, like, where are the bottlenecks and all the threads here and what's okay. going on, what can we do? Just do? So we, we definitely done, done some work on that and we identified some bottlenecks and it's like, hey, okay, well, we missed a cutoff for this QA pass. So, But we definitely have, it's, I guess you'd say, a list of things that we want to take a look at in the future. It's like, hey, here's... Uh, uh, some of the ones to send out, I guess, probably be the image decoding uh, and downloading of stuff. That's definitely fast Uh No, fast there is a branch for at least OpenJ. Well, no, you guys use Kayak KDU internally. What am I talking about? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so uh, to answer your question about Joe about fast timers. Uh, so no, so uh, if you take a look, there's uh, was an LL profiler. Uh, so I had support in, so there's actually three different defines you can set. So you can, one is build with no fast timers, one is build with fast timers, one is build with Tracy, and then I think the fourth configuration was build with fast timers and Tracy. Uh, so out of the box, we don't actually enable Tracy to, uh, to residents. We just use it internally. Uh, so fast timers is, is what's been, I guess you could say our legacy timing stuff, which is, uh, been sprinkled throughout the code, and we have a macro which will then, uh, or we should say preprocessor macro, which will take all that stuff and convert it to the equivalent Tracy calls, so we don't have to keep adding stuff in. And we've been also been adding, uh, adding marking functions up with Tracy data as well. So one of the things to note is Tracy definitely, uh, it's a fantastic tool, has really great granularity, but it generates a crap ton of data so across the network, so you can, uh, it's something to be careful about how much uh, instrumentation you do add to your to your uh, to your viewer so I mean, actually one of the things that I recently a few months ago was I think LL profiler categories so we can actually turn a lot of that stuff off just because Tracy generates so much data mm. yeah we uh, probably have a look at the wine stuff uh, we've been more just focused on Windows and, and Mac stuff so if uh, you're running wine under what Linux then or under uh, Mac? Linux, okay. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, Linux has uh, been neglected. Uh, some of us want to see more platform supported, and some don't see the the business need of it. So it's 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 a trade off. That's one. It's one area. Third party viewers definitely do a much better job of supporting Linux. I know my own viewer is uh, Linux only, but I can cross compile to Windows. Nice. Yeah, I'd recommend uh, using Tracy. Uh, it's, it's pretty, really nice, and it's got a pretty good. Uh, uh, they call the, the terminology is a little awkward for Tracy, but they do actually have a, a server, <laughs> which is actually uh, a viewer, a front end, <laughs> front end viewer, you could say. Uh, and so it does the capture. You can see where the stalls are coming from, and you can do thread uh, profiling, you can do memory analysis, and also do uh, stalling. So Tracy is really, really nice to use. Really, really nice. Really impressed with it. Well, well it is. I use Tracy on my own system. But no, well, I was only testing under Wine because I don't have a Windows machine other than an old Windows 7 machine. So mm -hmm. I will wait until all that code makes it into Firestorm before I actually use it on Linux. <laughs> nice coffee. Yeah, that's one way to do it. <laughs> I wait for another third party to do, to do the work. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, that's a viable strategy, I guess. <laughs> I just use Wine when I need to upload something, and I need a version with Havoc in it. Ah. How do you get access to Havoc? I thought that wasn't available. To, is it available to individuals or? No, no, no. If you, I can run the Linden oh, okay. uh, gotcha. Windows version under Wine. Oh, nice. Oh, because the DLs, right? Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm not sure what Microsoft's doing with Havoc these days. 
Oh, okay, cool. I love physics extension CPP. Okay, nice. I think that's that's cool info. Thanks. So yeah, I definitely uh, recommend coming to the uh, content creator meeting on, on every other Thursday too. So uh, focus is a little different, but there is definitely some some high, a lot of overlap too. So it's uh, yeah. I would also suggest making a Jira. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, yeah, dandy. I'll make the freaking. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I, 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 I have a like broken records, but make Jira's. Uh, it, it really does help us uh, to make a public Jira and give details there, and it really does help us keep track of the pulse of what the community is uh, wanting and some of the, what some of the issues they're running into. The great grand pickled Kamuchisaurus roast of Linden Labs on the Jira. <laughs> we have a lot of technical debt, and we're aware of it, and. Uh, uh, we just... Well, I, I don't envy you guys. Like, it, you've got yeah. probably multiple generations of developers. That, that, that having anybody that probably understands the code base top to bottom, also like like a, a generalized that's, literacy is probably hard. Well, I think it's that's that's a big problem. I see a lot of code bases. It's just trying to get your head wrapped around understanding all the various subsystems and how they interact is definitely very challenging. Uh, it's not meant as an excuse, but. But it definitely is challenging. Uh, rewriting stuff is also... I've ne never really seen where big rewrites pay off, so to speak. Uh, I mean, in the game side of things, uh, I'm aware of it being done once <laughs> in, so, in like decades of stuff. So that was with Final Fantasy XIV, where Yoshi P basically told his devs, hey, go play World of Warcraft, <laughs> because our Final Fantasy XIV sucks so bad. <laughs> so they, they basically did a big rewrite. So that was absolutely... Absolutely crazy! They're actually able to pull that off, but uh, for the most part, a product already already quote unquote works. So you, you don't break stuff that already works as much as we want to touch code and kind of modernize it. But there definitely has to be some sort of cleanup uh, pass and phase being done. And, and, and unfortunately, our, our workloads are we're just swamped. I got one of the things I'm doing on my own branch is I'm basically getting like trying to get rid of as much of the standard types where they're, they're using all the custom declarations. I just want as close to STL as possible. STL. I want to be able to just read C. Like, that's it. I don't have to worry about what this is underneath the hood. Like, this data type, we're good. Yeah, yeah there's, def there, there's definitely disagreement, so to speak, on how much C modern C to adapt versus how much legacy stuff to adapt. And. There's that, and yeah, the coding standards probably needs to be updated too at some point, and say, hey, this is we're using this version of C++. These features are okay. <laughs> These ones are not. So, uh, that the sheer amount of wrap guys do sometimes for some of the things like that. That too. Uh, I, I was looking at like what what it took to get like a, a texture type for a bind call. Uh, or, or, yeah. Or, or, you know, it's just like okay, we we go from a num. To get the index of the array for the right thing, and then then the method itself for this thing has like an if check that checks if it wasn't the thing that was returned by the array. It's like well, what? Why not just use an unordered map here, please? There's a lot of hoops. Yeah, in some places. Yeah, it definitely is frustrating. That's for sure. Sure. So, yeah. You know, I'm not going to knock you guys for um, staying with some older C++ because I'm on the other side of this. That is, I am writing a whole new viewer in Rust using Vulkan with multiple threads using uh, RAN3 and, and uh, WGPU. And I have bleeding edge everything. I would not recommend this approach for current production. Two years <laughs> out, maybe we'll talk. Like, I mean, you, you've seen, I, I posted pictures, I posted yep. videos. That looks pretty uh, cool. That looks pretty cool. What I really have is, the, is basically the part that draws stuff. Um, effectively, what I do is I log in um, my all stays in one place, and I can cam around. That hmm. that's basically what I've got. Neat. And, and you know, I have to re-engineer everything. I just spend an entire month figuring out how how planar texture mapping actually works. <laughs> yeah, code base yeah. is complicated, and the features. There's I mean, like when we were doing Eve, there's just so many edge cases we were running into constantly all the time with that, and it just. It's just little things that just slowly add up. <laughs> right, right. I mean, so I have to understand, you know, what part of this is supposed to work? How is it supposed to work? Um, and, but I'm, I'm past that. Um, 
It's not as awful as you may think it is. The problem is the levels below me aren't ready yet. REM3 isn't finished. WGPU isn't finished. Mm. What I get from using them is portability. They deal with the metal versus DirectX versus Vulkan issue. Yep. And if you want to go to Vulkan, you've got to find some kind of toolkit that deals with that nonsense. Or your uh, yeah, we, your we've uh, <laughs> we've uh, looked looked into that <laughs> quite a bit actually <laughs> last year. So and yeah, there's everything uh, that does that is pretty bleeding edge right now, frankly. There's some libraries that are more mature than others, but yeah, it's it's uh. <laughs> uh it's definitely an interesting topic to get stuff. It's a cross-platform. It just sucks that Microsoft and Apple want to push their own proprietary stuff instead of just adopting a single standard. It just definitely complicates lives for everyone. It's frustrating. So, I I think Rust is a huge win. It's all over the place, and it actually works reliably. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I keep keep uh, keep meaning to check Rust out every, every so often. We just keep focus on this, get busy with that stuff. Graphics programming Discord. I mean, there's there's always the battle between the Rusters and the the C plus plusers, where it's like, oh, Rust is so much better. It's going to replace C plus plus. Maybe like the, it's, the people have been saying that for ten years. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I come from a game console background and. I still remember just even C++, <laughs> just trying to get that kind of standardized and for just the, the the biggest problem was just the, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think heck, heck, even GCC alone, because my, my ship, my first game was on uh, PlayStation 1 with GCC, so uh, I've, I've seen the whole gamut of basically of broken C libraries is just bloated and slow, and C++ compilers have been bloated and slow, <laughs> so it, it's it's... It takes a while for stuff to get standardized and, and uh, standard library implementation because obviously game community cares quite heavily about performance, not not just runtime performance, but compile time yeah. performance as well. So C++ is, is it's it's here to stay. I, I don't see Rust taking that taking that spot for quite some time. It, the tool chain has to be mature. I mean, C++ is, C Sharp has made pretty good uh, inroads uh, as f and on off offline tools. Uh, definitely other languages, but as far as the actual core engine side of things, no, C++, it's, it's kind of the, the right level of abstraction. you got the low-level abstraction if you need it. you also got the high-level abstraction if you need it. It seems to have a, a good balance. So you just don't see uh, Microsoft or Sony or Nintendo pouring develop money into supporting Rust when developers are like, hey, we already use C++, we've been using it for literally decades. We, we yeah. know it. The tool, the tool, it's right. basically I, I tool chain support. In the near term either. Yeah, but it's. I mean, more languages is always nice. Don't get me wrong, but I think it just comes down to just an ROI and you, yeah, the tool chain for C plus is as much as people hate some of the C plus things that it does. It, the tool chain is, I guess you could say, mature. So endless, unearthed more features that you never knew even existed. 